Well, there's been a lot of important news concerning some viral disease outbreaks, and I thought I'd pick the brain of a great virologist. Uh, joining me now is Vincent Racaniello, Ph.D. Dr. Racaniello is a professor of microbiology and immunology at Columbia University, and he runs the fantastic website, Virology Blog at virology.ws, and a whole slew of podcasts. He's got a media empire. Dr. Racaniello, welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you, Robert. Happy New Year. Same to you. It's been, it's been a few months, and uh, uh, and I want to go ahead and dig right into what's going on with your Zika lab. I went to Zika um, Diaries, and um, there hasn't been any any updates posted in uh, in a couple months. And uh, you had the unsuccessful attempt to secure funding for um, a study you wanted to do on Zika narrow virulence. Uh, so what, uh, what's been going on in the Rack and Yellow Lab in the past couple months? Well, we, I stopped writing uh, Zika Diaries over the holidays. I figured oh, okay. people needed a break. <laughs> and then my, my virology course here at Columbia started up uh, in January, so I was a little busy with that. And, in fact, not, it was just this week now I put a new post up there uh, on the Zika Diaries all about publishing because we're, we're writing up a paper, and I thought it would be interesting to – to discuss with people uh, how we decide where we send the paper to. So I'm back to writing, and you should see more recent, uh, more regular Zika entries from now on. Okay, great. So so you you have this one grant, um, I don't know, what's the right word, unapproved, disapproved? Yeah, disapproved. We didn't get our money, basically. Yeah. So we resubmitted that because, you know, the criticisms were, we thought, not really valid. So it's back in there, and we'll hear in a couple of months. But in the meantime, uh, we have to write some other uh, grant applications. We're doing one on Enterovirus 68, which is another uh, virus that we've been interested in. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a tough year, but uh, we keep trying. You know, we don't give up. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, and it was really interesting to read one of your last posts and uh, what you what your comments to them were and what you yeah. were actually thinking. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. Well, you know, the, the blog gives you an opportunity to say things that you might not otherwise say. Right. I'm taking advantage of it, especially since I'm kind of near the end of my research career, and it doesn't really matter what I say anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good. Um, now, there's been... Just because there's not much coming out of the Rack and Yellow Lab, there has been a lot of research on Zika. And uh, I was looking at some numbers, and it looks like about uh, there's been about 1,400 publications on Zika, and, and over a 1,000 of those have happened just in the past 12 months. So the research is blossoming. There's tons of it. And I wanted to get your thoughts on some of the latest. Um, and uh, there was a CDC study uh about mid-December, and it showed that uh, Zika virus RNA replicated and stayed in the brain tissue of infants with microcephaly Mm -hmm. and placentas of women who suffered pregnancy loss for at least seven months after the mothers contracted the virus. Uh, Can you explain what they were doing in this study and what your thoughts on it are? So this is a study out of the CDC where they uh, looked at a number of cases imported into the U.S. from, from other countries and these are cases where uh, some of the mothers had confirmed Zika infection during pregnancy, and some of them gave birth to babies uh, with microcephaly. Some of them, uh, the children died, and they took specimens from the placentas and the, um, the fetuses to see if there's Zika virus RNA in them by a polymerase chain reaction. And overall, the, what they found is that in, in a number of cases, uh, Zika virus is present, uh, in children born with microcephaly, so it provides more support for the role of the virus in causing that problem. Uh, interestingly, when the mothers get infected early in pregnancy, the first trimester, that's when you get the most birth defects in the children born. Second and third trimester infections, much less likelihood of a problem. And so that's really interesting. We don't know why that is, uh, but it just tells us that that first trimester is an important one uh, for the virus getting in there and doing damage. Now, when the, when the mother's infected in the first trimester, you know, the disease in the mother is transient. It's a rash disease that comes and goes within a week or two. But apparently, in a number of these children who were born, you know, you get the placenta at birth, they can still find viral RNA in there. Yeah. So uh, the virus is sticking around for a long time, 
whether it's a problem to the child or not, you know, in later times we don't know. So the, the virus is unusual that it has a, a tendency to persist. Now, they also find in children born, some of these children are born and they die, they find virus in the brain. So it could be that if your mother's infected in the first trimester, uh, baby's born, maybe even if you don't see microcephaly, the virus is still there and it could be causing later problems. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this is one of these interim studies. We, we need to do a lot more of these as uh, children are born to infected mothers to figure out exactly what's going on. Yeah, I, I, one one thing that's clear to me is we go through some of these studies is it, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no doubt about that. Now, in a related topic, uh, there were a couple of reports that showed that microcephaly and other brain abnormalities in fetuses and infants exposed to the Zika virus during pregnancy occurred more frequently than previously estimated. Um, however, the proportion of the infants with birth defects uh, differed between the two studies. Um, can you uh, give us a summary of that? Because you can explain this stuff really, really well. So this is a, another study of, of, of cases um, where they have confirmed infections in pregnancy. And when they look at, the, again, the three met trimesters, infections in the first trimester, 11% of those lead to birth defects. And these include things that you can see like microcephaly uh, and other major changes to the fetus. So, and again, second and tri- third trimester, not much of a problem. But one of the issues in this uh, study that that it's brought up is that there are probably more subtle defects in these children who are born to infected mothers than microcephaly. Just because you see a baby born, you say, oh, there's no microcephaly. It doesn't mean that the virus has already done some subtle damage that's going to affect this child in its its early years of life. Things like cognitive issues aren't going to be seen later. So we're really going to have to do long-term follow-up on these infants born to infected mothers. Now, of course, one you know, other than um, uh, vaccines, the other issue that's important is uh, getting uh, good diagnostic testing. And uh, right. we see that Wadsworth up there in New York um, and the University of Texas Medical Branch developed a new uh, test that's more rapid, more accurate. Uh, this is some exciting news. Yeah, so right now the best way to diagnose Zika is by PCR, but that you only have about a two-week window while the virus is replicating. If you want to look longer, you have to look for antibodies. And the problem so far is that the antibodies against Zika cross-react with dengue and West Nile and yellow fever, so there hasn't been a specific test. And what they did at the Wadsworth was to come up with a test detecting antibodies specifically to Zika virus, and that's going to be really good. Now, remember, it has to be FDA-approved, but as soon as that's done, this will really help diagnose infections. Yeah, as soon as it's FDA approved, that's when it will get out to all the right. hospitals and the you know Quest and LabCorp and all that. Um, then there was a study from La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology, and it, it's basically talking about the positive effect of the CD8 plus T cells mm-hmm. um, on controlling Zika infection. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So here's a paper done in mice. Mice are great models for Zika infection. And they show that CD8 T cells, these are so-called cytotoxic T cells, they actually are important for protecting against Zika virus infection. You know, most of our vaccines work by making antibodies, Mm -hmm. and they protect you. But it looks like in these mice, uh, it's the CD8 T cells. And they also identify what parts of the virus are, are recognized these, by these cells. And why this is important is probably because uh, any vaccine in humans that's going to be in- effective probably needs to uh, induce a CD8 T cell response. And that's important information. Good, good, good. Now, that's pretty much what I got out of it. Now, I, I know you're reading research all the time. Is there anything that caught your eye concerning uh, new Zika research? One paper I really liked was published uh, this month in Cell Reports, and it clarifies a lot of confusion about what the receptor is for Zika virus to get. And as you know, cell receptors are needed for viruses to get into cells. Mm -hmm. And many papers have said, well, the receptor is AXL, A-X-L. It's a protein on the cell surface. Well, this paper shows in some cells it's AXL, in astrocytes and in glial cells but not in neural cells. So there are probably more than one receptor for Zika virus to get into cells. And the cool thing about this report is the virus doesn't actually bind directly to Axel, but it binds to what's the normal ligand for Axel, which is a protein called GAS6. So the protein, the virus binds GAS6, and GAS6 binds Axel, and the whole thing gets taken up into the cell. I thought that was a really great study. 
Yeah, I, I, I saw that also. Um, I'm talking to Dr. Vincent Racaniello with Columbia University, and we're looking at some viral diseases, some viral news, and some viral outbreaks that are going on around the planet. And one of the bigger stories that's been going on uh, during the course of January uh, leading into February is a yellow fever. And yellow fever is another virus that's transmitted by the 80s mosquito, the same one that transmits dengue, Zika, chikungunya. Um, Brazil is getting a pretty serious outbreak right now. It's, uh, some reports say it's the worst outbreak in about 17 years. Dr. Racaniello, can you give us a little primer on the yellow fever virus and yellow fever disease? Um, it's more severe than many of the other mosquito-borne diseases. Yeah, that's right. Even though it's in the same family as Zika and uh, West Nile virus, it can cause more severe disease because the virus uh, can infect the heart, the liver, and the kidney and destroy those organs. And so you can have a lot of fatality, which you don't normally see uh, in adults infected, uh, say, with Zika virus. So there's lots of yellow fever left globally. WHO estimates about 200,000 cases a year and 30,000 deaths. Uh, and so that's why it's a big problem. Vaccines in limited supply. And the issue here is that there's a monkey reservoir for the virus, and that's how this outbreak in Brazil has been occurring. Uh, monkeys get close to people, and the, the virus is transmitted from the monkey to people, and, and they get sick. Yeah. Now, you know, yellow fever was, was once a big problem in the U.S. Uh, I don't think it's been seen since the turn of uh, the... 20th century, yeah, 1900 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the mosquito vector. We have plenty of travelers to the U.S. Um, from Brazil, for example. And I, I would suspect a susceptible population, a naive population. Um, any concern about yellow fever popping up here in the United States? I don't think so because, you know, Aedes aegypti, also the vector for Zika virus, uh, we've only seen local transmission in Florida and Texas in very few cases. So at, at the most, I would say that's that's what could happen uh, with with the yellow fever virus. It's not likely to go further north than that. Right, but but we can't say the risk is zero. Not zero, yeah. but certainly pretty low. And of course, we do have a vaccine here in the U.S. That, that I'm sure if there were a small outbreak in Florida or Texas, they'd deploy that right away. Sure, sure. Um, now, in addition to the Brazil yellow fever outbreak, one of the bigger viral disease news stories in recent days and weeks is the soul virus. And uh, we saw about eight cases in Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, again, Dr. Racaniello, can you give a primer on on this virus? And um, I, I would say this is a uh, something that most Americans never heard of. I think most Americans have heard of C. nombre virus, which is a hantavirus that emerged in the Four Corners region of the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of years ago. That's a virus that's transmitted from deer mice to people. You can inhale, you know, uh, aerosolized urine or feces or saliva. Uh, It causes hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Soul virus is from the same family, uh, except it doesn't come from deer mice. It comes from rats. And again, the, my, the rats are infected. They don't get sick, but they can spread the virus to people. And what's happened? And, and for this virus in people, it causes not hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, but hemorrhagic fever with with a kidney syndrome. And what happens is, uh, in this outbreak in the U.S., 13 states have reported infections. Ten in uh, Illinois and Wisconsin. Pet rats are transmitting the virus to people. There's some rat breeders who uh, have been raising rats and selling them, and unknown to them, the rats are infected because the rats don't get sick. You can't really tell. So uh, this is the source of this infection, and uh, it's going to continue because I think people apparently like to have rats as pets. Yeah, apparently. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't realize there was such a thing as ratteries. I'm like, what on earth is that? (laughs) Yeah, it's apparently so, and you you can't tell they're infected, so it's a a threat. But, But... but you would agree that the soul virus is is uh, less pathogenic compared to the sin nombre virus. Seems to cause less of a serious disease. Right. There, you know, there are fewer cases. Um, but uh, you know, I would say to people, avoid rats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I guess that leads to my next question. Um, this little tidbit, and I want to see if you had any concern about this. The CDC says that this is the first known outbreak associated with pet rats in the U.S. Any any uh, concern about that? 
Well, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we're always seeing new viruses popping up like this. The question is, uh, have they been around before and we just didn't recognize them? You know, I think people have always probably had pet rats, um, but maybe we didn't recognize the syndrome before, or maybe this is really something new. Uh, we'll see. I, I do hope that uh, we can uh, use ways of, of diagnosing the rats to make sure that, you know, these ratteries are virus-free. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, there's been some measles up in your part of the woods. I did. I did see that. Then. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw saw one in Long Island and a couple cases in northern Jersey. Right. Um, I guess, I mean, I've talked about measles on here a hundred times. So, you know, as a virologist with decades of experience, do you b- believe there's a more communicable virus than measles or is that... Is that the top of the heap? It's pretty high up there. I always tell my medical student classes, I'm standing in front of 150 students, and I said, if I had measles, you'd all be infected right. by the end of the lecture. And that's because it's a respiratory transmitted virus, but it's just really good at uh, getting from person to person. And if there's some un- unimmunized people, they're going to pick it up, and that seems to be what happened here. Now, is there any other virus that compares to that? I don't think uh, many come close. I think smallpox is pretty transmissible as well, no. but I don't think it comes close to measles. Flu is way below these. You know, flu doesn't. Even though flu gets a lot of news, um, a lot of numbers of cases, it it's not as transmissible as measles. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's a. Uh, I got about um, till the break. I got about a minute and a half. Okay. And uh, January marks six years since the last uh, polio case reported in India, and this is um, near and dear to your heart. Uh, in about a minute, can you talk about the significance of this milestone? So as you know, WHO wants to eradicate polio. They've been working on it since 1988. And India has been a tough nut to crack for years and years. There were huge efforts to vaccinate in India. Never made much of a difference. People, kids were getting five, eight, ten doses of vaccine. Uh, and there was some thought that we would never be able to get rid of the virus, which transmitted freely. Yet, as you say, six years ago, they did it. It's an amazing accomplishment. The significance is if we can do it in India, we can do it anywhere. And the only countries left now where there's still wild polio are Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. And the only reason the virus isn't gone from them is is we have armed conflict that prevents the vaccinators from getting in. If we could get in there, India proves that we could uh, immunize and get rid of polio. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's an incredible story. I remember first reporting on it when it first happened, and, you know, you kind of, like, sit back and wait, well, how long is this going to last? Well, it's lasted so far. I think it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time, and that's going to be some outcome, eradicating another viral disease. Okay. Oh, so you, um, time frame, when will polio be eradicated? Well, I think it's going to take another five or ten years because this conflict isn't easy to fix. Yet. Right, right, right. All right, Dr. Racaniello, can you hold on till after the break? i got a few more questions. You bet. All right. All right. Again, I want you to check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. And I encourage you to check out Dr. Racaniello's website. It's Virology.ws, and the title of the, of the website is Virology Blog. Great resource on all things virology. And I will see you after the break with more with Dr. Vincent Racaniel. Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Robert Harriman. Well, welcome back to the show. I am being joined today by virologist, writer, media guru, and professor, Dr. Vincent Racaniello from Columbia University. And we've been talking about some virus news, some virus outbreak information. Um, and I want to continue our discussion. And there was a very interesting study that came out um, very recently concerning why some individuals get more get the more severe and sometimes life threatening dengue hemorrhagic fever? Uh, Vincent, you're familiar with that study, correct? I am, yeah. Yeah. Can, uh, can you go on, talk about that for a second? So in dengue, you get an infection. There are four serotypes. You typically recover. 
you make antibodies to whatever serotype infected you. Then if you get infected with a different serotype, then you make antibodies to the first one, they bind the second virus, but they don't prevent it from infecting. In fact, they make the disease worse, and that's the severe dengue that we're trying to prevent. In this study, they looked in people with dengue secondary infections, and they looked at their antibodies, and they found that some patients that have severe disease have a very unusual antibody. It's, it's a variant antibody that lacks a sugar in a part of the molecule that's known to activate immune cells. And the idea is that without this sugar, the, the antibodies cause destruction of platelets. That leads to bleeding, and of course bleeding is a hallmark of hemorrhagic fever, which is one of the problems with this severe dengue. So this is a really interesting finding. First time this has been shown, and I think it makes it possible that perhaps we could identify the patients who are at risk for more severe dengue because it's not everyone, and then we could take care of them differently. So sure. pretty exciting study. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some of the stuff you, you're doing uh, over at virology.ws, virology blog. And um, you, you're doing a fantastic job. And I actually watched uh, one of your videos recently. Um, and I see that you're doing it for the ASM, the American Society for Microbiology now. Yeah, so we have, from time to time, I go to meetings and uh, interview people, and they send a camera crew. So we do some uh, interviews with people who are doing interesting virology out there. Oh, congratulations. That's great. And I, I uh, really enjoyed the interview with Dr. John M- Maze, I hope I said that right. Maze, 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 yeah. And um, uh, she's um, does a lot of research on in emerging infectious diseases. And uh, uh, can you give my audience a summary of your discussion with Dr. Maze? Sure. So, so Dr. Maze is running a global project. It's called the Novel Viral Emergence Early Warning Project, or PREDICT. And uh, what they're trying to do is go to places where uh, viruses typically spill over from animals into people and collect lots of specimens and find out what viruses are out there. She wants to know all the potentially dangerous viruses uh, all over the planet. And so far in in a couple of studies that they've done, she said she's discovered 800 uh, new viruses that that weren't known before. Now, what she'd like to do is kind of, if you remember the Human Genome Project, which was done over 10 years ago, you know, it was proposed for $3 billion we were going to sequence that first genome. Well, she wants to do the same thing uh, for the for the virome, and she figures it'll cost about $3.5 billion. She wants to spread the costs across the world, and but... Most importantly, she wants to put technology into countries so that the work can be done there. She doesn't want us just to grab samples and leave. She wants us to enable countries to do their own sequencing and PCR. So, you know, it, it's a tough sell to tell people we want to spend all this money to find all the viruses out there. But, you know, I think it's a great project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if maybe if people were doing this before, would we – had a, he- a better heads up on, say, Zika. I think we need to know what's out there. Yeah. Right? If you don't, you can't do anything. So, uh, you know, we sort of knew about Zika. We didn't know how it was spreading as it was. But there are certainly other viruses out there that we should point at and say, hey, this one has potential. So, sure. But, but, you, but even with Zika, the, uh, the amount of information, about the amount of research that was done prior to 2015 was negligible. Um, unbelievable yeah, exploded so, yeah yeah um i also noticed on on your uh, website virology blog that you're doing more writing about prions mm-hmm, we are prions and <laughs> bacteria in fact today i just wrote a new a new post they found prions in bacteria of all things you know, prions in humans cause transmissible neurological diseases right like kuru and kreutzfeldt jakob mm-hmm. but it turns out that there are lots of prions out there uh that don't cause disease, and they just found them in bacteria. So that's really interesting. Yeah. I also wrote about uh, a blood test that's been developed uh, for detecting prions. You know, uh, the problem is we can't detect the disease until it's symptomatic, and then it's too late. But if we could find the, the prions in the blood, uh, we could be ready for it. And, and there were a couple of assays that have been developed that look good in terms of that. 
Yeah, and, and uh, actually, you allowed me to republish that story on my website, and I appreciated right. that. That was very good. So, what else exciting and new are you doing on Virology Blog? It looks like you're in and the podcast you're doing. It looks like you're doing a lot of podcasts now. Yeah. So at the blog, you know, I write a post a week, but the, one of the main activities is podcasting, and I have a little uh, little media empire, like you call it, where we do <laughs> this week in virology, this week in microbiology, this week in parasitism, uh, this week in evolution, and a couple of others. Um, and, you know, it's all about teaching people about viruses, bacteria, and so forth and, in a way that they can understand. I've even started a short video series, you know, eight-minute videos trying to explain uh, viruses. So they all come out at virology.ws. Uh, I also am teaching my course uh, in virology this semester at Columbia University, and I record all my lectures, and they go uh, onto YouTube and virology blog as well. So if you want to learn about viruses, uh, you should check those out. Yeah, good stuff. You know, it, it's funny. Uh, during the day while I was at the lab working, I was listening to one of your, I guess you call it TWIM, yeah. this, this Week in Microbiology That's right. off of um, Stitcher. And uh, the, the topic was about um, one, of the, one of your uh, guests was talking about bleach and cleaning yeah. laundry and and Germany and I mean it was the most fascinating topic and it was like oh well you know laundry uh, practices are changing we use lower temperatures and less detergent so the question is is that having an effect on the microbes on our clothes and that was that was what that discussion was all about yeah fascinating stuff all right well th- thank you Dr. Vincent Rackenyellow for your time and expertise and all the interesting stuff uh, you laid on us today I appreciate it very much Robert, always a pleasure, and, you know, the microbes are just fascinating. Yes, sir. (laughs) I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Vincent. You're welcome. All right.